I'm Dan Carell, CEO of the Digital Commerce Alliance, and this is Commerce Code, a bi-weekly digital commerce podcast for leaders in card linking, loyalty and digital marketing, mobile wallets and payments, and financial data. Thanks for joining this running conversation with leaders in the industry. And if you like this podcast, come join us at a Digital Commerce Alliance event. You can learn more at www.digcomall.org. This week on Commerce Code, we are headed down the student loan rabbit hole in a big way while keeping one eye on the retail, marketing, banking, and fintech space that Commerce Code is always focused on. American student loan borrowers owe $1.78 trillion right now and growing, as I've mentioned on Commerce Code before. Federal loans represent 90% of that, and most federal loan borrowers haven't paid a penny in well over three years. When they do, it's going to change their wallets, their bank accounts, and I think their psychologies. The numbers are big enough that it could impact macroeconomic stuff like inflation, housing prices, and more. So we're going down the student loan rabbit hole, and yes, I will talk, at least in part, about the loan system itself because it's interesting and it probably affects a lot of listeners. But we're also going to be thinking about what it means for executives as they make business decisions relating to consumers, 44 million of whom have a student loan. My guest this week is, well, me. Um, I am, of course, CEO of the Digital Commerce Alliance, but from late 2018 to early 2021, I was Deputy Undersecretary and then Senior Advisor at the U.S. Department of Education, or ED. ED doesn't do curriculum. That's up to school districts and universities and teachers and stuff. But ED does do higher education finance, among other things, grants and loans. And what started off small has now become a very big student loan portfolio. I worked on student loan policy when I was there. Most people who deal with post-secondary at ED do. I worked on some other stuff, too. To be honest, in the last two years, I have followed the developments in the student loan space pretty generally. And student loans is an area that's pretty precise and rather confusing. So following it generally isn't probably good enough. You've heard me talk about student loans before, um, connection with lots of things, but sometimes credit scores. In the last episode, in fact, we had Ricard Bandebo from Vantage Score and Christian Woodholm from Bloom Credit on the show. And they were talking about credit data quality and credit scores. In that kind of conversation, student loans naturally comes up. Well, I ended up talking a little bit more with the Vantage Score folks about the need for clearer and better information about student loans, even though there's an absolute avalanche of information about them available already. The problem is that avalanche is really hard to understand. Someone needs to distill it into plain English, get rid of all the excess information, all the inaccurate information, the misleading and sloppy information. There's a ton of that stuff. That someone ended up uh, being me, and the time for that ended up being the last, I'm not sure how many days. I've written a couple of blog entries that I think we'll post on the Vantage Score website soon with the goal of helping people understand how the system works, what they need to do to get their payments started again, what programs still exist, which ones have been ended, all that stuff. I went into that rabbit hole late last week, and I think it's Wednesday today. Like, really, it's one of those. I think it's Wednesday. I'm less uncertain about what I know on the student loan front, though. At this point, uh, it's a lot. I consider my memory refreshed. And a lot of stuff has changed even since January of 2021 when I left the agency. It's one of those situations where, you know, you're in or you're out. You can't sort of half know things about the system because it's a seamless web. So I went back in. And this podcast is not going to try to summarize everything that I've put into the blog posts or everything that I learned in the last six days. And you should be glad for that. But I want to hit the big points. I want to tease out some of the implications for retailers, for business leaders and for the economy. And yeah, I'll talk about some of what it means for borrowers. So stay tuned for a deep dive into what's going on with student loans. July 2023 edition. Commerce Code is sponsored by Pentadata the all-in-one financial data API. Whether it is bank account data, credit card transaction data, or credit reports and credit scores, Pentadata has it all in one simple and easy-to-use API. With coverage of over 6,000 banks, over 200 million credit files, and 60 million merchants, you can get all the data you need for your apps at pentadatainc.com. (laughs) 
I am struck as I did this work that borrowers have the hardest job in the student loan ecosystem. Uh, private lenders run the businesses that they choose to run. Uh, simplicity is good for business, so their systems don't tend to be that complicated. Uh, the government runs a very, very complex system, but it's only true obligation is to follow the rules that Congress writes. Congress gets involved only occasionally when they feel like it. At least that's been true to date. It, Congress, one would hope, may have to get involved to try and straighten some of this stuff out. But borrowers have to look at the whole situation. They got to look at the value of the degree, time to completion, future labor markets, origination fees, interest rates, different repayment plans, forgiveness options, forbearance, deferment. What are those things? Is there a difference? Yes. Bankruptcy treatment and a lot of other stuff. So borrowers, I think, have a tough position. I want to start with some basic basics, and I am going to run through it almost kind of like an FAQ. I've got a bunch of questions, and I'll give you the casual, imprecise, roughly right answers on the podcast that sit on top of a much more solid foundation that we're going to put up in the blog post, which is very precise language that I've spent a lot of time putting together with uh, sites exclusively to government sources. I never quite found any private sources that I thought were fully reliable. So it's purely where I could find bedrock for some of this information. So um, here's the casual version of all that. What happened to student loan forgiveness? Biden administration announced that they wanted to do a forgiveness plan. I think that was last year. The Supreme Court, after a bunch of challenges, basically said, look, you've said you're going to do this on a certain statute, and that statute doesn't let you do this. Of course, the Supreme Court didn't agree with itself, but more people said that that didn't. That's it. So that approach to student loan forgiveness went away June 30th. Why are some people having their loans forgiven anyway? You might have noticed maybe that this is happening. Um, there have always been a lot of programs that forgave student loans under certain circumstances, but they've been badly carried out or not executed in a, maybe the way that it was envisioned. This current administration has gone through the process of just in a variety of different ways, figuring out how to um, find the people who maybe could have had their loans forgiven in the past. And then where possible, they basically figured out how to forgive them. So there have been a lot of folks who've had their loans uh, reduced or forgiven or whatever through a variety of different things. And I won't get into all that. What happened to the repayment pause? What's the story there? So in March of 2020, as everybody remembers, if you remember that month, I suppose everybody does, uh, the government set the interest rate on federal student loans to 0% and suspended payments. And I think it's been nine times that that has been sort of extended. So I guess each action had to only went for a certain amount of time. So it's been extended nine times. And then uh, in June of this year, Congress passed and president signed a law having to do with the budget. Right. And that was what forced a compromise on this. And in the compromise, it required that that payment pause would end on September 1st. And like the first payments would be due in October. So, Everything on this topic is wrapped in uncertainty, but I would say that is a statute that the president signed into law. I think we can say that that is happening, right? People will start paying in October. What happens next? Well, literally the day that the Supreme Court ruling came out, I mean, the administration was expecting the ruling, you know, to, to go that direction. And so they um, had a, a White House, you know, Rose Garden, whatever press conference the same day. I don't know if it was in the Rose Garden, probably wasn't. And they, they said three things. They said, hey, we're going to do a new debt relief program. We're going to base it on a different statute, but it's going to take a long time. Uh, and so honestly, what happens there is is TBD. We really don't know. Number two, they said, we're going to create a new income driven repayment option called SAVE. I think it's called Saving on a Valuable Education. Anyway, they already started that process and it comes in two parts. And so SAVE is something that's partly implemented now and partly implemented in about a year if in fact it all gets implemented. And I'll talk more about that later, but that's an income driven repayment plan. I think that's really significant. And then another thing is really significant for maybe more like the commercial world, people who follow credit ratings and commerce code type folks is the government said that they're going to do a 12 month on ramp to repayment. And that really was just in the white house announcement. So if you dig down, or at least I dug down and couldn't find details in the regulatory world in, in ed as to exactly what that looks like, but the on-ramp is meant to say if people miss payments, it's not going to be considered delinquent and it won't be reported to credit bureaus. And we don't have a lot of more details on that, but that might be significant. So when do payments resume? As said, looks like it's going to be in October. Um, interest definitely starts uh, reaccruing on student loans on September 1st. Now, I said that the SAVE plan was an income-driven repayment plan. And so let me just explain what that is. The government has always had a variety of different, well, for the last 20, 25 years, the government's had a variety of different 
income driven repayment plans and you know private lenders don't tend to have this i don't know how much state loan uh, student loans have have this but the federal government has had income driven repayment for a good long time and the idea of course is you say hey here's my income and then there's going to be some formula that says well above a certain amount of income we're going to take a percentage that'll be your income driven repayment plan to date what's happened there though is you know i mean if you're if you're only paying a, a smaller amount because of its income driven repayment the loan doesn't go away, you know, and you're not paying as much on it. So in the past, that has really caused a lot of the most difficult stories to date, which is that people have a large number of people have a loan balance. They owe more than what they originally took out. And it's generally speaking because they're doing income driven repayment and their income was low enough that they didn't have to pay that much per month. But it just kept going. Right. Like it just kind of would keep going. Now, income driven repayment plans have a tendency in their structure to say, hey, if you do X number of years worth of payments under a certain formula, then at the end of all that, even if there is still a balance, well, we'll we'll forgive it. There's been huge problems in general in getting that to actually happen. And so a lot of your horror stories have something to do with that. And it's also true that there are, you know, I count at least four major income driven repayment programs. And I think that's before you have the next, the new one called save, but save if it is fully implemented will be a huge game changer. And there's a wide variety of estimates. And obviously, it depends on people's politics and their perspective. But there's a good chance that SAVE, if fully implemented, would be almost as impactful a tool for forgiveness of loans as like the original forgiveness plan might have been. It's different in the sense that people need to make payments and payments for a certain period of time. But basically, the payments are going to be lower. The period of time they have to make them is is less. And if you fully implement the whole thing, it looks like a very significant reduction in, in total payments that will have to be made by consumers. Um, and then, of course, the other side of that is that, you know, a smaller total proportion of, of the $1.78 trillion that the government theoretically is owed would come back. So talking a little bit about payments, just a few different things. What if somebody stops or delays making payments? The most common context is, you know, you finish undergrad, you're going to go to grad school or, you know, something like some of their life context happens. You, you know, you're serving the military for a while or whatever's going on. And so there's a couple different normal channels, like typical channels. One is deferment. The other is forbearance. Deferment basically says, hey, I'm not going to pay for a while. And during that time, you know, the interest kind of builds up. And then at the end, oftentimes it's capitalized or it's added to the to the principal. Um, forbearance is only available under certain kind of special circumstances. It's the same as deferment, but the interest doesn't capitalize. You know, the interest doesn't build up. And so forbearance is better, but not that many people can get it. More, more typically in the economy, in life, is people just don't pay. And so if a payment is, you know, a payment's delinquent the moment it's past due, but, you know, when it gets to 90 days or more, that's generally when it's going to be reported by the servicer um, over to the three credit bureaus and it, and it kind of goes from there. I mentioned that the administration said, hey, we're going to have this 12 month on ramp to repayment. And what they mean to say in that, or at least what they've said about it so far, is we're not going to report delinquent payments, non-payments to the credit bureaus, et cetera during that 12 month period. So that's a little context for, as we think about like from a business perspective, from a personal perspective too, you know, what was the next year look like? That might maybe be a significant part of that. What happens if you don't pay for a long time? Well, the way that um, default works is after 270 days, nine months, that's how it, for federal loans, the loans are, are considered to be in default. And default is a surprisingly large number of Americans have had student loans in default I'll a little bit more about that in a minute, but it's really harmful to the consumer. And so, you know, full balance of the principal and interest are immediately due. It's reported to the credit bureaus, hurts the credit score, obviously eliminates eligibility for deferment and forbearance. It eliminates eligibility for any further federal student aid, can lead to tax and wage garnishment, legal collection actions, people being hounded by collections agencies, all that stuff. It's a debt. You know, that's the way it works right now. It's it's a debt. And so people who are in default on their debt. There's a lot of horror stories there and it's it's hard on people. So having set it up that way, I'll say, what happens if you've defaulted? Without getting into the details, I'll say that this administration, the Department of Ed, uh, put together something called Fresh Start. And again, I've talked with Vantage Score folks about this a fair bit because you know they've been, in, you know, to their credit, I think, in, in conversation with folks in the government and Department of Ed, whatever, about various aspects of this because you know they're doing credit scoring and, and there are 44 million people with, with student loans. It affects a lot of Americans. So the Fresh Start program is designed to enable defaulted borrowers to, and I'll read the quote from the Department of Ed as to how they describe it, re-enter current repayment status and have other federal student aid benefits and protections 
restored. And I think, so for example, you could maybe get deferment and forbearance. You could, I guess, get more federal student aid, although maybe not where you want to be uh, in that moment. Although it may be, right? Because there's a lot of people who are in default who are like a year away or whatever from finishing their degree, and that might be part of the problem. So actually, I, I can I can take that comment back. It, maybe it does make sense for them to do just a little bit more aid, or maybe at this point they're eligible for a Pell Grant, for example, and couldn't get it because they were defaulted. So all that stuff makes things better. So that's the Fresh Start program. And you know, again, I, I think one of the things I'd say about all of this, having been inside the um, machine, is... There are a lot of Americans. I think there's like 330 million of us right now, 44 million that have of student loans. Anything that purports to comprehend sort of the whole country is hard to administer, just the sheer volume of it and sometimes the complexity. And so I think with all of these things, one of the questions you have to ask is, will the department struggle as it has in the past? And this isn't a criticism of any particular person or whatever. It's just as the department has struggled in the past to process all this stuff. Is it going to happen? Can it happen? We'll see. What happens if if uh, the borrower declares bankruptcy? I think everybody knows this, but just to make sure we remember it, except in extremely, and I mean extremely rare circumstances, student debt is unique in that it cannot be discharged in bankruptcy. It makes no difference how bankrupt you are. You go through the whole thing, everything else is discharged in bankruptcy or dealt with by the bankruptcy judge, and your entire student loan balance, including interest and all that, is still there. That's the deal. It's one of the things that's made it um, so tenacious and tragic for some people. So brief riff on are there other ways to have loans forgiven? So can people get loans forgiven now that the kind of main forgiveness program got struck down by the Supreme Court? Yeah, I'll rattle through a few things quick. There's the idea that maybe there's another student loan plan that'll come through. It's going to be at least a year, probably more um, for that thing to come through. It'll be challenged legally, whatever. So I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in that, but sure, it might happen. The save thing that I mentioned before, it is an income-driven repayment plan. But the more, the more I look at the details of that, and I think others, uh, others would agree who've looked at it, it looks like a pretty big, you know, a big program and a big deal and a good deal for some borrowers. And if, if fully implemented, I mean, it could reduce to zero a lot of people's monthly payments if their incomes are lower it can significantly reduce the total amount paid etc so like is that forgiveness well yeah um, at the end of the day it is for a lot of folks there's a thing called public service loan forgiveness as it sounds like you know it's if you're in public service or certain kinds of nonprofits that qualify you can have your loans forgiven after a certain amount of time again like what's happened in the past is the agency has really struggled to administer that in an effective way again not any particular criticism of anybody it's just it's hard and so this administration has pushed really hard on figuring out how to get those things forgiven, and they have uh, for a lot. So there are some people who probably, I'm, I'm sure of it, there are people sitting out there in the world who are eligible for some forgiveness that they're not even quite aware of yet. Teacher loan forgiveness is another program, similar idea. There's another thing called a TEACH grant where it's people have received those and, and had a hard time kind of with, with some of the administration there. Again, things have, have been smoothed out in some ways, you could say, in this uh, administration. And then there's finally a thing called borrower defense to repayment, which uh, is kind of a niche thing. It doesn't affect that many people. It's only if you went to a for-profit college that defrauded you in some way. And so eh, that said, uh, there's a meaningful, you know, absolute number of people in the world who have received some relief on that. And I'm not sure how many more there are. This administration has kind of tried to push a bunch of them through. Okay, shifting to to some mechanics that I found really interesting when I look back at it to just find out what, like, what is going on today as opposed to what was going on even just a couple of years ago when I was was there. What's the interest rate on federal student loans? And, you know, I think I think if you're not involved in federal student loan borrowing, you probably think, oh, it's the whole point of these things is that they'd have an attractive rate, right? Uh, maybe. So anyway, the way Congress um, set the formula is that for undergraduate loans, you take the three-month Treasury bill rate plus 3.1% at a specific moment in time, I think it's like June or something, each year, and then boom, that's your rate, right? So the three-month T-bill, 3.1%, and then that's it. And then for graduate and for parent plus loans, it's the one-year Treasury bill plus 3.1%. Now, you all can easily figure out, because we're people that pay attention to this kind of stuff, those rates for new loans are pretty high right now. And the other thing, of course, has happened is that, you know, Congress, somebody in Congress, picked, you know, a three-month for one and a 12-month for another on the presumption that, you know, they'd be like they normally are. But, of course, we've had inversions of those rates, too. And so we're going to get some weird um, interest rates. Here, here's the short of it. Talked to a friend the other day, and, and he was asking about this, and I looked into it, and I said, look, I mean, the rate for a parent plus loan these days, and would be true for a graduate uh, student loan, too, is 8.05%. Compared to the interest, you know, or rather to inflation these days, and maybe you don't think it's that bad, but holy cow, uh, just doesn't doesn't leap out at you as a particularly great interest rate. Uh, loans for just 
undergraduates, if you have a young person in your life that is taking out a loan right now, it's going to be at five and a half percent. Uh, even if they're, you know, let's say they're a junior in college, even if they took out a loan when they were a freshman two years ago, that was at like, you know, two and a half, it's five and a half. Couldn't have been two and a half, sorry, because of the formula, but it might've been three point something. In the past, overall, I looked at the history of the loans have been as low as 2.75%. The highest they've been, I think is eight and a half percent. I think it was back in 2008, something like that. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about briefly was how much can you actually borrow for college? Because I think this is widely misunderstood. Um, undergraduates are heavily limited. They can only borrow from the federal government anyway, $5,500, $5,500 for the whole year, for their freshman year, their first year. It goes to sixty five for their second year, seventy five hundred for their third, fourth, and, and if they have it, their fifth year. And then the maximum total federal borrowing for an undergrad is $31,000. So when you're talking about people who've taken on $100,000 in student loans for undergrad, they did not get that from the federal government, right? That has to have included uh, private or state loans. The independent undergraduates, which are pretty rare, right? They are emancipated for financial aid purposes from their parents, can borrow a little bit more, but still, you know, it's their maximum is fifty-seven thousand five hundred. Let's just say. So, I mean, that that's a that's a lot of money for an undergraduate degree, but they can borrow more. The significant point about all this, so having mentioned the limitations on undergrad, is that conversely, for grad school, sky's the limit. You know. You can do your thing. You have the ability to take out what we call direct loans, which are a certain program, and then direct plus loans, you can take out the rest up to the school's total claimed cost of attendance. But these days, the claimed cost of attendance is like $80,000, et cetera. So it's a lot. And that's where people are getting into deep debt. Parents also can take out an unlimited amount, and it's not means tested. So through the Parents Plus loan program, parents can rack it up and most don't, but some do. And again, tragic stories come in train. What about private student loans? Private student loans offered by many companies, including Sally Mae would be the best recognized because they used to be the one that offered uh, all the government loans uh, or many of the government loans. The private market now represents 7% of the total market and it's overwhelmingly for undergraduate students. And it's because undergraduate students can't borrow that much from the federal government but they don't have a ton of graduate student lending in the private market because graduate plus loans, you can take out as much as you want from the federal government. So for the most part, people would go with federal loans there. I mentioned before that some states have um, student loan programs too. And so um, that is a piece of the pie, but a relatively small one in the scheme of things. So I think that kind of gives you the basic basics overview of some of the things on the student loan front. So what I want to do now is turn to, uh, let's say, kind of the economic viewpoint. So student loans and the economy. How much student loan debt is there really? It's 1.78 trillion. That counts private, state, federal. Is that a lot more than before? I think we have to have a lot of skepticism about everything that we're hearing, especially when people are beating drums about it, right? Because if you adjust for you know inflation, whatever, all these different factors, like, is it really more than before? Okay. So the answer is um, yes. Uh, so it does start with a T, not just a B. And so 1.78 trillion is a lot more than before. Federal Reserve data for student loans goes back to 2006. And at that point, we really were on the student loan bandwagon well and truly. So we already were were going and we had what you know maybe we could have regarded as a whole lot at that time. But in inflation adjusted dollars, like in 2023 dollars, in 2006, borrowers owed in total 724 billion. And so now we're at 1.78 trillion. So that, that's a 245 percent increase in the last uh, 16 years. That turns out to be if it was linear, an annual growth rate of about 15 percent. And, you know, during that most of that time, and I looked at the, the his, historic inflation trends, you know, it was between one and three percent inflation. You had some years a little higher, a little lower in the last couple of years. Of course, it's gone up a lot, but generally a low inflation period, but 15 percent annual average increase in in student loan carrying. So, yeah, that's a lot. The other thing you got to ask yourself is, well, OK, um, how many college students did we have in 06? Did it really change a lot? The answer is not a ton. So total post-secondary enrollment looks like it grew about 4% from 18.3 million to 19 million since 2006. Those kinds of numbers, again, are just a reminder of how darn big this, this country is. You know, we've got 19 million people that are engaged in some way in college or grad school right now, which is, it's just a lot. And that just gives you a sense of how, how these numbers get to be so big. So yeah, 1.78 trillion is a lot more than before. Let's put it into some context, though, in terms of consumer debt and where the consumer and the household is at. So the Federal Reserve um, has the best data on this by far. And so I looked at their 2023 Q1 credit report and it shows total outstanding car loans. And I've always, I've always compared it to car loans because it's like pretty close. And it has been since about 2009. Student 
debt total 1.78 trillion, car loans is 1.43 trillion. Total credit card debt right now actually is at 986 billion. And then mortgages, all mortgages in the US are 12 trillion. So, you know, total household debt is 17 trillion, just all of it. Student loans are then 10.5% of all household debt. But I will hasten to add that it's distributed more unevenly, right, across households than mortgages, credit cards, auto debt. You get a lot of households who just don't have it for, you know, they didn't go to college, they, they went to college, they paid for themselves, whatever. So a lot of households just don't have it. Whereas mortgages are much more ubiquitous, credit card debt is much more ubiquitous, car loans much more ubiquitous. So like, yeah, it's 10.5% of all household debt, but it, it's probably more like, just making this up, but like 20% for the people that do have it and then zero for the people that don't, something like that. Is it a lot compared to other major parts of our economy? Look, I, you know, I, w- when you start talking about things that you know, trillion with a T, like I, I don't think any of us have the ability to really process, w- w- is, that, is that a lot? Um, okay, so this is all apples and oranges, but let me just say a few things here. Total U.S. national debt, we just know that it's enormous, right? But that it happens to be right now 32.5 trillion enormous, so for whatever that means. Federal government total budget, including Department of Defense, all this kind of stuff, is $6.1 trillion. To me, that's a little bit more of a, okay, I can kind of understand. So one, $1.78 trillion is, you know, pushing on a third of the full expenditure of the federal government in a year. But here's the thing. $1.78 trillion represents the amount borrowed and then interest in this kind of stuff for people over the last, you know, over decades, right? Mostly the last decade, but decades. So it's not, it's again, apples and oranges. And then annual U.S. GDP, $26.5 trillion. Gives you an idea. So, so you know, make of it what you will as to whether $1.78 trillion, $7, trillion is, uh, is a ton. With all the talk about student debt, have college students slowed down taking out student loans? Yeah, a bit, which I think is interesting and not surprising and healthy. There's some uh, National Center for Education Statistics data that I, I quote in the blog post that shows that the proportion of undergraduates who take out loans at all dropped from 50% in 2010 to 38% in 2020. Uh, so that's interesting. And it wasn't, you know, there wasn't just like pandemic year stuff. That was just a consistent trend that happened over that 10-year period. And then the average amount that they borrowed, if they did borrow, also dropped uh, only by 8%. But still, the point is it didn't keep sort of jacking up. So it, the, the thing, at least as far as undergraduate loans, may have peaked. Grad students might be a bit of a different story. So are grad students taking out huge amounts in loans? I actually found after much, much time spent on this, a little difficulty in proving to my own satisfaction what the state of graduate borrowing is because it's, well, I won't even get into why. I just say it's a lot, unquestionably. It's a big proportion. People say that grad students comprise 25% of borrowers and about 50% of debt. And that's the thing that I couldn't, to my satisfaction, validate. But I think it's probably directionally correct. And just to give you a feel, as of, I think it was 2016, when the most reliable data was sort of available, People with law degrees had 145,000 if they just finished the law degree, right? Like, not not if they were 65 years old. 145,000 for lawyers, 246,000 for MDs, doctors, and then PhDs had 98,000. I guess it was 99,000, really. So, yeah, grad students take out the big loans, and they can and they can take it all from the federal government, and really nobody's minding the store. It's the plus program, and it's uh, it's an open spigot. So what proportion is total student debt held by private lenders? I think I mentioned this before, 7%. It's about $127 billion. So, you know, there's plenty of private lenders out there. They're running, you know, uh, coherent businesses, et cetera. But it's not, it's not a big part of this whole thing. It's just in terms of percentages. And there's a lot of reasons why people borrow from private, including the fact that we have a lot of international students that come to the United States. There's not quite a million every year. Um, who are here. And to the extent, they, they have a tendency sometimes to come from pretty affluent families, but not in every case. And so they're not eligible for federal student aid at all. And so that, that's one example of, of what you know would cause a person to take out private loans. Another would be that they just, they really want to go to a school that costs more than they can get from the federal government, more than they can afford. And so um, they go the private route. Okay. So consumer impacts. What happens to 44 million Americans this September when they start to become aware that they need to start making payments and that interest has started to accrue as of September 1st, and then they got to start making payments in October. Okay. When repayment resumes, are we expecting a lot of delinquency and default among student borrowers? I'll mention again that the administration has said, hey, we've got a 12-month on-ramp, so we're not going to be reporting delinquencies and defaults and this kind of stuff. And they've got the Fresh Start program. If people enroll and do some stuff, they'll be able to sort of rehabilitate some past problems. So it's going to help some folks. 
But there's a fair bit of analysis in the, the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, has done you know a good deal of, of its own analysis on this kind of stuff. And I think across the board, and Vantage Score has I've talked to them about this, and they've done some good work on it too. There's reason to believe based on looking at how people who have student loans, even though they haven't been paying on those student loans for the last three years, how they've been doing on credit card payments, like you can make some inferences there, right? And so based on that, I'll just like summarize it all and say, there's reason to be concerned about what happens in October with at least some of those 44 million Americans. Okay, so that's number one. We think that delinquency, late payments, uh, ultimately some default, like that's going to start happening again. You can also say, how do you handicap or assess like the psychology of people who are still rightly thinking, well, I don't know, like, isn't it going to get forgiven or something? And I personally assume that that's going to impact people's assessment of like, well, if I'm choosing between paying, you know, credit card debt, like nobody's going to forgive the credit card debt, like that's for sure. And my car loan, like they're not going to forgive that either. Or the student loan, which I can't quite figure out what's going on here, but it seems like they're still talking about some kind of forgiveness, right? It could be that that we do see a lot of of that, and it could become a bit of a cultural issue and an economic issue. I don't know. We'll see. What's the credit score impact of delinquency and default? Vantage score obviously has some more precise stuff on that, and I won't get into it too much here, other than to to say, you know, visit their website. They're good on this stuff, and they've done a lot of work on it. But and again, supposedly for the next for the twelve months from October, delinquency won't even be reported to the credit bureaus, and so who knows how that's going to all kind of work out because we don't have the details on it yet. But, you know, for sure, when people don't pay, it has a negative impact on their credit score. When they when they default, as I mentioned before, it's a disaster in tons of ways, including their credit score. And so I think we expect to see some problems and then it's going to be weird to see how it works out because of this business of it not necessarily getting reported as it might have before. Are students overall making progress on paying off their loans? And so let's just well, say you know, pre-pandemic, right, because everything kind of got frozen in time in March of, of 2020. The only non-government piece that I have uh, linked to in any of the work that I've done is a really interesting New York Times. It's an opinion piece, but it's all data driven and it's got some terrific data visualizations. And they just do a really nice job of showing based on publicly available data that half or more of student borrowers at this point have balances that are bigger than what they originally borrowed. And that, that trend has really accelerated over the last decade. That just wasn't that way. If you go back to like 2010 and before and to nobody's surprise who follows this stuff closely, it is just not evenly distributed demographically, right? Uh, just very much depends on race and a variety of other factors that they look at in ways that, again, wouldn't be surprising if, you, if you've if you looked at this stuff before. So the author's suggestion from this is they basically said, I think the title of the piece was, look, these loans aren't getting paid off anyway. And their, their angle and his opinion piece is, so therefore we have to do something, right? Because people aren't going to pay them off. Because they haven't been, right? They've been literally getting, growing the balance over time. That I think relates back to this question of like the, the behavior of borrowers has been aggressively in the direction of income driven repayment, lowest possible payment. And if the balance keeps growing, it, it doesn't seem to have deterred a lot of folks from sort of their approach. And so when payments restart in October, what are they going to do? I don't know. If that's an indication, I think we're going to see people paying the absolute least that they can on these loans. So- how much does a new income driven repayment plan, which is the save thing, change the system? Let me just bottom line it and say a lot of uncertainty in my mind. I think a lot of people's minds about like, is this thing really going to go through the way that it's written? Will it survive? Like there'll be legal challenges. There'll be all kinds of stuff. Let's just say it does right in full because it's being implemented a little bit now, a little bit later. Let's say it all goes through. What they're saying is monthly payments will be cut in half for undergraduate borrowers. And there's there's just a formula there that suggests that that is true. And it'll be more than cut in half, actually, because of some reasons. There'll be a lot more people whose monthly required payment is actually zero. Like, there'll be a lot of people who literally don't owe anything. And that is their payment. And it will count towards like ultimate forgiveness. There's a lot of interest that is going to be forgiven here. It used to be that interest would, would uh, build up and then capitalize if it was you know in excess of what you needed to pay. Not, not under this plan. So under this plan, you pay what you pay every month and, and that it doesn't really make any difference. And as I understand it, the way that they've set it up, at the end of the period of time, and it depends on a formula for how long you got to pay, the stuff gets forgiven, the interest and the principal. Balances can be forgiven in as soon as 10 years, depending on how much you borrowed, but a maximum of 20. And again, the stuff all goes away. And then interestingly, it's a lot easier under the rules that they've put together here for married couples to separate their finances um, for purposes of student loans. So you got this income driven repayment idea. And then you say, well, OK, so my my wife is uh, I'm making this up. It's not actually true, but would, you know, from my lips to God's ears. Right. My wife's an investment banker and she makes all kinds of money and I, I do whatever I do. 
you know, it would be in my interest if this were true for me to jump onto an income driven repayment plan and to separate out, you know, our finances. What's happened here, they're saying is, look, if you just filed married, filed separately and will automatically regard you as two different entities for these purposes. That's what the rules seem to say. That is one of the many parts of this that hasn't actually happened yet. And so we'll see what really happens. But that could have a pretty meaningful impact for uh, a lot of families. And I think I'll come back and just kind of close this section by saying, you know, can the administration actually process all this stuff? I mentioned it before. It's really hard to process this. And this is where federal student aid, which is the sort of the office within Department of Ed, has struggled in the past. Uh, the guy running it right now, Richard Cordray, used to be head of the CFPB. Um, he's a legit genius, very bright guy. Uh, can he do magic? I don't know. Um, he can win Jeopardy. I think it was Jeopardy he won. You know, so maybe he can do this too. I it's gonna it's hard. I don't diminish the difficulty there. And so um, we'll see if they can actually carry this stuff out. But there's it's one thing to sort of get the legal stuff to work, which is very hard. But I think I'm just talking mechanically now. Can they actually process all this stuff? That has been in the past where uh, the government has really has really struggled. OK, last thing on kind of the mechanics of student loans, and then we'll go to a commercial break and then we'll come back. And then we're going to have just some thoughts on how this, I think, likely impacts or may impact consumer psychology, consumer behavior, the economy overall, et cetera, as we get into sort of Q4 of um, uh, 2023. So last thing is the Biden administration is pursuing another student debt relief plan that is just forgiveness. And you could imagine that it is probably intended to look much like, maybe exactly like, what they had attempted to do before and what got blocked by the Supreme Court. The reason that they could end up in exactly the same place, and you'd think, well, how's that possible, is that the court didn't say, like, you're not allowed to do it ever. The court just said, you meant to do it. You said you were doing it on the basis of the HEROES Act. This is a statute that was passed after 9-11. And you were kind of using your emergency powers as granted by that act. And the court said, like, no, that doesn't fit. Like, just won't, I won't get into it. But like they said, no, that doesn't fit. But what they didn't say, of course, is that you could never do it ever. And basically, the administration just needs to find another statute. All along, they've known that there is another statute. It just takes longer because of the process that's baked into it. And so the Higher Education Act is a, one of these giant statutes. It gives the administration, the Department of Education, the power to do lots of things. And it regulates, you know, sort of the whole student loan thing. And so within that, it gives the Secretary of Education sort of general powers over the student loan system, which if you think about kind of how things have to be administered, like that would have to be true, that the secretary would have to have some amount of discretion to do stuff, in particular, the stuff that uh, the statute gives them the secretary the power to do is, quote, I'm quoting from the statute, enforce, pay, compromise, waive or release any right, title, claim, lien or demand, however acquired, including any equity or any right of redemption relating to student loans. So, you know, and that's a pretty general thing, right? And you'd think, well, hmm, I don't know. sounds like the secretary probably can do whatever he wants. It's more complicated than that. Um, I wouldn't actually wager one way or the other as to whether an attempt to forgive student loans in high amounts, you know, like they want to, will survive a legal challenge. I, I just don't know. There's more to it than what I just said. But the the process is going to take a year or more. I, I've, I've heard a lot of people analyze it from the perspective of like, look, in a way it's almost on purpose because it runs through the election year. It gives them a good election issue, probably won't be done by the time the election even happens, all this kind of stuff. I, w I make no comment on any of that because it's just, I don't, I don't really know how right or wrong it is. But the point is that the idea that there'll be another student loan forgiveness moment is just really going to hang over us for the next, you know, through the full election. So it's really not going to happen anytime soon. And it'll be mostly sort of shrouded in uncertainty that has been validated to some extent by the way that the first thing went. And so uh, that that's not great for our culture, our political culture or whatever, but as just, I think, the way that it is at this point. So that's a run through the key facts on student loans. And I'll just reiterate that a far more carefully worded and much more precisely sourced version of this with a lot more detail or whatever will be online in the next uh, while. And I think we're going to put it on Vantage Score's blog because it's kind of pertinent to what they do with the credit scoring and sort of their their broader broader audience. And so I'd say if you have any further questions about, you know, what, what I've said, whatever, just go there. But as always, I'm at dan at digcomall.org and I'm more than happy to respond to emails that come in. We are going to have a quick break and a message from Vantage Score. And then I want to come back with some closing thoughts on sort of what this all means for consumer psych and consumer behavior and the economics of the big, you know, Christmas and retail season. Back in a minute. Come 
Commerce Code is brought to you in part by Vantage Score. Nine of the top 10 banks and over 3,000 leading banks and fintechs use Vantage Score to predict and manage repayment risk. Learn more about the latest advances in credit scoring and how to grow your lending business by leveraging financial inclusion at VantageScore.com. Okay. I want to close with eight things that I have to say about culture, economics, and maybe business as we close out 2023. And I have to say up front, what these things mean for each business from where you sit, whether you're at a bank or a card issuer or a network or you're doing promotions, you're writing software or whatever, it's going to be different. Okay, so that's the caveat up front. But I want to give you some raw material to work with in terms of where I think things are headed. Eight things. Number one, wallet shock. A lot of people who haven't made a payment in over three years are about to make a payment again. It is going to happen. It's going to happen in October and it's going to change their deal. Like it's going to change their psychology, et cetera. But here's the thing that hasn't been talked about a whole lot. If you were a college student in 2016, you were a first year college student, you haven't made a payment ever. And you graduated from college in 2020, right? Because you graduated in 2020. You probably had been in deferment. You hadn't been making payments. Everything gets frozen in March of 2020. You graduate and then you proceed to have three years. So now it's seven years since you took out your first loan. You have never made a payment. So there's wallet shock for people who are going to resume payments. And there's kind of like, but that's been the, what we've been talking about. There's going to be plenty of wallet shock for many millions of people who's li- who literally never made a payment before. It's a it's a big chunk. And they took up you know disproportionately more. Like it grows every year as to how much people take out, right? So you're talking about a non-trivial amount of, I don't know how many billion, like 100 billion or something in loans that have never been paid on before. Number two, bureaucracy shock. I expect a good deal of frustration with you know how unavoidably sort of challenging it's going to be for people to sign up for deferment programs or to find their new loan servicer because some of the loan services are changed and to find the, the what their account number, whatever, right? I mean, there's a statute of limitations in your mind somewhere on something being real. And I think three years is well past it. And so there's going to be some real frustration on like just dealing with the bureaucracy of this. And whether this is anybody's fault or not, it is really hard for government agencies, loan servicers, whatever, to deal with a country of, you know, 330 million people with 44 million of them who own loans. Like you make one like tiny mistake in a software thing and it's a major problem and a lot of people have a lot of pain over it. So there will be that. That's number two, a bureaucracy shock. Number three, uncertainty. There's a lot of complexity. It breeds uncertainty. There's a ton of uncertainty and there's a lot of uncertainty no matter what, because we don't know what's going to happen with forgiveness. We don't know if the different plans are going to go through. We don't, you know, et cetera. So if you put yourself in the shoes of somebody who is originating loans right now or trying to figure out what kind of payment plan to have, whatever, I mean, the correct answer, weirdly, is you got to play the odds. You don't know. And I'm not really sure that that's ever been true in the past when it comes to this stuff, because it feels like in certain areas, there's a coin toss chance that a meaningful amount of whatever you're about to take out as a loan will just go away for one or another reason, right? And that really gives people significant, like I think they call it FOMO, right? It's like, yeah, fear of missing out on having $20,000 of student loans go away because you chose the wrong loan product. For example, you might've chosen to go with, and I had a conversation with somebody yesterday on this front exactly, which is you chose the private loan because it had a lower interest rate and and a smaller origination fee than the public loan. Right now, especially that can happen because interest rates are high on government loans. And so that's the deal. And the only thing I said to him was, well, nobody's going to forgive the private loans, but yeah, they're definitely cheaper in the offer that he'd been given. So just flip a coin, draw straws, figure it out. Like there's a lot of uncertainty. The public loans could maybe be forgiven or not. Stress. Young people are stressed out these days. There's no question about it. Just anxiety. Talk to any college counselor, anybody involved in that, you know, dealing with that age group. And so you know, competent together, high income, high earning, high spending young people. I'm old enough that everybody's young if they're under 40. Also experience a ton of anxiety for reasons not fully understood. But let me tell you, nothing about what's going on with student loans right now is going to make that better. So, you know, the on-ramp thing seems like it, it would be helpful. This is a business of not reporting delinquencies to credit bureaus, et cetera, except, you know, it, it will entice at least some people, maybe not many, hopefully not many to be lax about stuff and then not make payments. That's not going to be good for their stress in the medium run either, because eventually they're going to figure out that you you can't do that forever. I think there's going to be political and cultural tension to state the obvious. 2024 is an election year. All the stuff that's going to happen in terms of the continuing development of student loan forgiveness efforts 
is happening across the arc of that election. There's some people who think that's on purpose. I don't have an opinion on that. But the point is, it's going to be a contentious presidential year. And the conversation about student loan relief will be much more real because you'll be having it with a group of people who now know what it's like to not pay and who have just been reacquainted with what it's like to pay. And so I think that that might be a a more divisive issue. I'm not sure how it plays out. I have to mention race issues, and I don't totally know how they fit in here in terms of what happens culturally. But if you take the student loan burdens and debts and all this kind of stuff and break it down by race, you get, as you always do in, in matters educational, some really different impacts and by race. And so the demographics are real. The impacts are disproportionate in different levels. And, you know, that hasn't in, come up in the sort of conversation, like in the really public level conversation outside of policy circles that I know of. But, you know, it certainly could. And, and if the political discussion of loans gets more acrimonious, then it, then it will. Pessimism, second last thing, I guess this makes it seventh. There's a sense of brokenness in the system. The more you look at it, right, the more you go, gosh, it's just it's a Rube Goldberg device that actually doesn't even work like Rube Goldberg made devices that at least theoretically would work. This is a old cartoonist who made funky things. If you haven't heard from it before, you can, I don't know, Google it. We built a system that's pretty complicated. I will say it's, it's not as bad as the healthcare finance system and payment system. So, okay, we got that going for us, but it's, it's tough. And so that I think leads to a you know lack of trust in, in established systems and a pessimism. You know, and even if a forgiveness plan were implemented, I think there'd still be a lot of disappointment in how the things it didn't do and all of that. So there is going to be some pessimism and that's just the way it's going to be. Last one I will toss out there for consideration. The more you put on the table, the possibility of real money being forgiven, going away, whatever. And then you tie it to conditions, which every proposal has. There's a lot of gaming that's going to go on. So my last point is is gaming of the system, you know, becoming even more baked into the culture than it sort of currently is. And so income different repayment, if it becomes as elevated a system as the current proposal would have it be, you can have people doing significant things to manipulate the flow of income and to arrange their affairs in such a way that they can have pretty meaningful reductions in payments owed and then ultimately forgiveness of of student loans. I think that as is kind of always would be the case, it's the most affluent people who have the most to gain or lose because they get the most student loans in a lot of cases. And they also have the wherewithal to manipulate stuff. And so I don't think that that really ends up being common, like in the sense that there are that many people who would do it, but I think that could become prominent. In other words, it could easily become known that you have a, you know, a subclass of people who are doing pretty well, but have figured out how how to have one spouse not make any money, quote unquote, maybe, and then have another spouse that kind of makes all the money. And that would allow them to just basically have a a big chunk of student loans ultimately extinguished at the end of of an IDR plan. Will that really happen? I actually doubt it for a lot of reasons that that just wouldn't fully be implemented, but at least on paper, Right now, as I read everything, it's possible. And I think that comes right back then, and maybe I'll close there on a slightly depressing point, which is that, you know, it's just that none of that's going to help with the cynicism, the stress, the the anxiety, or the negativity about kind of how the system is working, which is not, not the greatest for the culture. How does that then influence sort of consumers, right? Well, I do think that this will weigh heavily on the consumer psychology of, you know, when, when loans start getting paid, whether or not it's like out there in the open or on the in the media or whatever, 44 million people start doing something new in October of 2023. That's not not going to affect the Christmas shopping season. <laughs> so point one. And, you know, the way then to think about how do we tie into that? And, and I would assume without explicitly mentioning the student loan issue, but how do we sort of approach creatively, empathetically, the consumer knowing that a lot of our, you know, affluent, most capable, educated consumers are kind of having this experience. So that's that's maybe a, an umbrella closing thought. Let me close with something slightly more optimistic for, for listeners, which is to say the reason that you got a big student loan problem in this country is that Western countries generally in the United States is just happens to have the biggest concentration of it have absolutely outstanding universities, incredible places that do wonderful things. And this is something that happened while we were doing that. So for all the negativity, and I'm not the guy to normally pour the glass half empty, I'll just pour the glass half full and say, we're blessed and we're fortunate to have what we have. 
not just in the United States, but in other countries, other countries have student loans too, by the way, they're not quite as big as ours, but they're there. And so we're fortunate to have it. And this is something that we need to fix as we go. So welcome your emails, your thoughts, your comments. Thanks for listening to Commerce Code. Commerce Code is a bi-weekly podcast bringing you conversations with executives who are leading the way in digital commerce. If you like Commerce Code, your company should join the Digital Commerce Alliance and become part of our mission of advancing trade for good through standard setting, industry networking, conferences, and best practice sharing. Check out our website at www.digcomall.org. On behalf of DCA, have a great week. <laughs>